All right, so John chapter 9 today. This will be our last sermon in John for a while. Okay, we're going to take a break from the rest of the gospel. We're going to return to it later this year, maybe even the beginning of next year. Um, But this will be our last one. And then next week, my good friend Tim Jordan is going to be speaking. And then the following Sunday, we'll begin a new series in the Old Testament book of Esther. So if you get a chance, read through that book here in the next week or two as we get started. I think you're going to be surprised at what's in the book, and I think you're going to be blessed and challenged as we jump into it together, okay? So that's the Old Testament book of Esther. We're going to begin that in two weeks. So this is our last week in John for the time being. Jesus said, and we talked about this last week, I am the light of the world. Jesus didn't say, I magnify the light. Jesus didn't say, I strengthen the light. Rather, he is the light. He is the light of the world. The light only comes from Jesus. Hope only comes from Jesus. Salvation only comes from Jesus. Today, in our text, and typically we have somebody in the church, one of the members, read it. But uh, just because of the length of it and the way we're working through it today, I'll read it. We'll work through it together. But But in our text, we see the light doing what he does best. And we see two distinct polar opposite responses to the light. When the light shines, some people see truly, genuinely for the first time. And others are blinded by the light. They're scared of the light and they run away like cockroaches or or like Dracula, right? In John's gospel, light and darkness are at war. It's one of the themes you see over and over again in his gospel. But don't confuse that war like light and darkness with something out of Star Wars that we've talked about before. Like there's the force and there's the dark side of the force. And they're two equally powerful sides and we don't really know who wins in the end. Don't understand light and darkness that way. They are at war, no doubt about it. But we know who wins. And Satan, really deep down, knows who wins. But the darkness still fights on in in an ultimate act of feudal rebellion. As we read, notice the light versus the darkness. Notice the responses to the light, right? Who responds and in what way? See if you can see what people represent which side. But Jesus is about to heal a blind man. And so as he's healing this blind man, we got to ask ourselves, well, does he have a bigger picture in mind through this miracle? What else is Jesus trying to show us and to teach us about himself, right? About who he is through this miracle. This is a miracle that John calls a sign. He does that a lot in his gospel. He doesn't refer to them as miracles. They are miracles, but he refers to them as signs. Not all that Jesus did was recorded. In fact, John tells us that much of the things Jesus did aren't recorded. But he tells us that what was recorded was given so that we would believe. That we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. Signs point us to something. Signs point us to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, right? John refers to Jesus' miracles as signs because they're intended to show us something. So what does giving blind uh, or giving sight to the blind man point to? What does it point to about Jesus and about what's coming? Those are things we want to consider today. Look at verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now that's an interesting start to this text. You pick up the story with Jesus and his disciples coming across a blind man, and the disciples ask a question that reveals a debate in their day. Rabbi, who sinned? This man sitting here, he's blind. Obviously, somebody sinned, right, for this to happen. Who sinned? Was it him or was his parents that he was born blind? Notice how there's only two options in their mind. Do you see that? There are, there's no, like, option C. Who sinned? He was born blind, so whose fault is is it? And this reflected popular opinion of the day. He's blind, and he most certainly deserves it. It's either his fault, or perhaps, since he was blind from birth, it's his parents' fault. There is even some documentation of rabbinical teaching 
of the rabbis, not biblical teaching, but teaching of the rabbis that if a pregnant woman were to worship in a temple, worship in a pagan temple, and worship a false god, that that child in her womb was also guilty because that child was worshiping that false god too. This is one of the things that, that was taught in their day. So in either case, in their mind, this guy has it coming. And of course, that's quite a convenient stance to take because then you don't have to care about him. You don't have to open up your heart, your, your purse strings, right? You don't have to go out of your way to help this person because they have it coming. They deserve it. For all our progress, all of modern technology and all of Western progress, I think we often, if we're honest, still resort to this type of thinking, right? Um, it's a way to release ourselves of any responsibility to avoid hard questions like why, why them, why not me. We resort to obviously they had it coming. And if they didn't want this to happen, they shouldn't have done this. Yet it's hard for us to understand, I think, even, even thinking about that, it's hard for us to understand how little empathy that the sick, that the lame had in Jesus' day. They brought this on themselves. They were considered contagious. They were outcasts. Think about the disciples here. They walk across this man who's been blind from birth, and they speak about him as if he isn't there. They talk about him like he's a theoretical uh, talking point. The man is blind, but he's not deaf. And you're going to read here further in the text. You're going to see what a, what a character, a full character this blind man is. But they have no regard for this man who's begging. Hey, who sinned? Is it him or is it his parents? That's what they ask. On one level, the assumption is correct. That we have suffering, that we have pain, we have disease, we have deformity, we have death because of sin. Generally speaking, that assumption is correct. Originally, the world was created without any of those things. But sin, man's sin, brought all of that. Before sin, there wasn't death. There wasn't chaos. There wasn't tsunamis and murder and tornadoes. Nashville, that tornado struck this weekend, and people just died in their homes without notice, just, just instantly gone to meet, meet their Savior, to stand before him. In the beginning, God created, and everything he created was good. And then sin brought the curse, and sin brought destruction, and sin brought chaos, and sin brought death. So we're right, in one sense, to connect general suffering with sin. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. There are times when you and I suffer the consequences of our own choices, okay? So there are times when that's the case. I don't have a tattoo, but if I were to ever get one, I think I've told you this before, I would probably get that great reminder that helps me at times. Everything happens for a reason. And sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you make terrible decisions, right? If there wasn't a motto at times for me in my life, that's it. Everything does happen for a reason. And sometimes the reason is you made a terrible decision because you're an idiot, right? That's the truth. God, why? Because you're an idiot, Jason, that's why, right? That's why that happened. And then even in all of that, I notice the mercy of God, how often he spares me from the full weight of the consequences of my own decisions. I mean, we were talking about this this week in our life group, but God's mercy. How many times in your life did you just deserve it? Like you had it coming. God just spared you for some reason. It's just mercy. And God often does that. Well, God, why did you allow this to happen? Allow what to happen? Uh, you allow you to get what you had coming to you? To receive the fruit of your own choices? So there are times, right, when suffering and sickness is directly tied to personal choices. Our own choices or the choices of somebody else. We have multiple examples in Scripture. But we also understand that God has bigger purposes in all of our suffering. To use the example of Joseph, who because of the choices of his brothers was sold into slavery. Not his fault, but directly the result of other people's actions. And yet God in the middle of all of that sin was working it for Joseph's good, was working it to preserve his people. That's what God does. He's always in the midst working purposes that he has that we don't understand. And like the blind man born from birth, sometimes we ask why. 
And I want you to know that God is not offended by that question. That is a legitimate question that the biblical writers over and over again ask. And you as a Christian are allowed to ask that. Why? Because as far as I can tell, God, I've looked and I've searched my heart and I don't see any reason why this is coming. Unlike what we were talking about a minute ago, this isn't the result of a bad decision that I've made. It's here. I didn't deserve it. I don't know why it's coming. I didn't bring this on myself. Why? What have I done? And I want you to know that often the answer is nothing. Often the answer is you haven't done anything to bring this on. But God has other purposes in suffering than just consequences. Are, are consequences the purpose sometimes? Yes. But God has other uh, purposes as well. Other purposes than just discipline or punishment. Part of the reason the entire book of Job is in the Bible. Job, the physical suffering that he faces is compounded because it makes no sense to him. He's a man who's known for his faith. He doesn't have any secret sins that were told of, nothing. He's a man who loves God, worships him sincerely, and overnight he loses everything. And all of that suffering is compounded because Job doesn't understand why. It's painful and confusing. You know what else is interesting about the book of Job? And one day we'll work through it. The book finishes without him ever getting an answer. He never gets the answer to why. He has it now. But he didn't get it then. The reasons for his suffering are never given. Like it was for Job, at times for us, suffering and hardship is so mysterious. It's mysterious to us in those moments. God is mysterious in part because of his greatness. He has revealed much in scripture, but all the pages and all the earth can't contain God who is uncontainable. So, at times we pray, deeply on our heart, just just beaten about by whatever it is that's hurting us and causing suffering or pain in this life or with people we love dearly. We pray and we ask God and we say amen as the song says and it's still raining and it hasn't changed. And so we ask God, well, why? And I want you to know that it's okay to ask those things and it's okay to understand that. God is not indifferent to your pain. He is not in heaven saying, suck it up, buttercup. That is not the God of the Bible. God is not indifferent to your pain. Often God is not punishing you. One of the things that God tells us he's doing is he's molding us. He's refining us. He's shaping us. Think about, think about other things in your life. Think about things in your life that you want dearly, that are important to you, or a goal that you have. The best things in life come through struggle. They do. The best things in life come through struggle. Childbirth, right? Right? Good health. I mean, man, I, I, I don't know about you, but I want six-pack abs. But I, I also live as if each and every day is National Donut Day, right? That, that's kind of my life. So the only way I have ever had six-pack abs as an adult was by leaning hard against the chain link fence for an extended period of time. And then as I leaned, then, hey, Jen, look, you know, and then, and then it kind of kind of carved it in there. Not only that, at one time my daughter, who's homesick today, but she... In a reality, we were watching something, watching an exercise commercial, and uh, she was watching and was talking about six-pack abs, and she just, she was like five at the time, and she just looked over, patted me, and said, Dad, you have a two-liter. That's what you have. And uh, thank you, I think. There's going to be a struggle for whatever, ever's good, right? Like, that's how it works. Virtually everything worth having comes through struggle. Anyone ever can... A, or complete a couch to 5k, that thing where you get you off the couch to run into 5k in a few months, it works, but it isn't any fun. I mean, you get out there that first time and you're wheezing like a chain smoker and you look back and you've run half a block. That's as far as you've gotten. It's really discouraging. Several years ago, I was challenged to run a triathlon by some friends and to compete in one. And, and I had never really been a swimmer. And so the, the swim was a half mile swim in open water watched a bunch of YouTube videos on how to swim, got to the pool the first day, figured it out with the strokes and with the bilateral breathing and all of that stuff. And you know how far I made it the first day? 
one lap, one lap, and I was, I mean, I was done. And then on top of it, there was a 10-year-old kid in the next lane just stroking, just like back and down and forward and touching and going back. And I, I really thought in Christian life about holding his head underwater a little extra because it's not fair. Everything good in life, it takes struggle. Everything does, right? Most good th- things come through pain, come through hardship. That's how growth happens. But we kind of expect to be immune from that suffering. We expect to be immune from, from evil in general. We only remember the triumphs in the Bible of Joseph, of Gideon, of David. But Joseph endured 20 years of intense suffering, 20 years where he never got answers for his suffering. 20 years! Later, he was able to look back and see, well, this is why God did what he did. Because those 20 years of suffering turned a very childish boy into a man and prepped that man to lead really much of the modern world through one of the great famines in history. God was doing that, preserving his people through him. We think about King David and and the giant, but David suffered much in his adult life, on the run, certain that Saul was going to kill him, on the run from his own children later, or Paul, his evangelistic successes, and who doesn't want to be able to stand before the Father with a spiritual life like Paul, but forgetting all of the shipwrecks and all of the beatings and his eventual death for his faith. Listen, on earth, the good guys don't always win. That's how it is. When we do suffer, we expect relief to be immediate, right? The AC has been off for 35 minutes, and Lord, when are you going to return, right? This is, this is it. Let's go. I'm ready. I'm done. You know, uh, how long did Israel have to wander in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. So, can you trust God with your suffering? Yes, you can, right? Yes, you can. You, you know how you can trust God with your suffering? We've talked about this before. You look to the cross where your God came to earth, took on human flesh, and died in your place. D.A. Carson says this famously. I love it. You can trust a God who bleeds for you. He understands suffering. He took on suffering so that we could have life. Where is your God in your suffering? He is walking with you. Walking with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Walking with you through your pain, through your hurt. Weeping with you and for you. And all the while, he is orchestrating that pain, that hardship. He is orchestrating it for the good of the Christian. He's growing you. You know, as a Christian, I have the promise that God is for me. And it's great among other, the other things that we sing. I think singing about like the attributes of God is an important thing. You know what else is important? To sing about the promises of God. To remind ourselves. And we sing about this, that this morning. I am chosen. I'm not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. You're not against me. If I'm honest, it feels like you're against me right now. But you promise that if I'm a Christian, you are for me. You're not against me. Singing those promises. As Christians, we have those promises that God is for us. That Jesus, the king of all kings, On our behalf, before the throne, he intercedes. He prays for us. Read this this week uh, by a guy, Robert Murray McShane. He uh, died before his 30th birthday of typhus, but he wrote this. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, which is what the scriptures promise us he's doing. If I could hear him praying for me in the next room, the king of all kings has my name on his lips. I would not fear a million enemies. And he goes on to say, yet the distance makes no difference. We can't hear him praying in that next room, but it makes no difference because he is praying for me. It's true. Even though I can't see it, even though I can't hear it, God's people walk by faith. They don't walk by sight. So even in suffering, we can say like Job, the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away but blessed be the name of the Lord. So all that, right? Nice little free intro for you. Back to our disciples' question. Whose fault is it? And Jesus answers it immediately. He corrects corrects their faulty understanding of suffering. Who sinned? Try neither. Try this, verse 3. Look at verse 3. It was not that this man sinned 
or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You need a verse you should memorize? This is it. What did I do, God, to deserve this? Sometimes the answer is actual things. It's good to search your heart. But many times the answer for hardship is this. Who sinned? Not this man or his parents. Why, why was he blind? So that the works of God could be displayed in him. God is doing something and going to do something in him that the world's going to look at and go, wow, isn't God amazing? The blind man in this chapter is suffering. He suffered his whole life. He's a beggar that everyone has learned to ignore. One of the things that's revealed later in the text, they, re they ignore him so much. So later when he's healed and he's no longer blind, they're not even sure it's the same guy. We're not talking about a metroplex where people never come across the same person. We're talking about a place where everybody knows everybody and they have so ignored him his entire life that when he's healed, they're like, that's not the, that's the, that's the same guy? No, it can't be. That's his status in life. Everyone overlooks him. Everyone. Or like the disciples, everyone talks as if he isn't there. Little does this man know that God has a purpose for his suffering, something that God has planned for the foundation of the world. God has ordained that at this time and on this day, he would see, and he would see in such a way that only God is glorified. He is going to see that God has bigger plans for him than simply restoring his sight. The light of the world is going to shine into his darkened heart and the scales of the eyes of his heart are going to fall off. And he's going to see Jesus, but he's also going to see Jesus. That's what's going to happen. Look at verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and he washed and came back seeing. Unlike his disciples, Jesus isn't caught up in theoretical discussions. Upon answering their questions, what does he do? He immediately goes over to the blind beggar. He spits on the ground. He makes mud with his saliva and he places the mud over the blind man's eyes. Why? Why does he do that? This is a question that, that uh, writers, theologians, and pastors, they, they disagree about why did Jesus do this? Because in many other instances, all Jesus does is simply speak and something happens. The water is turned into wine without any ingredients. You know, he doesn't add like orange juice and then miraculously make it wine. He doesn't put mud in there and turn it to wine. It's just simply turned to wine. The man is simply told that his daughter is healed and she's healed. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the grave, he doesn't use mud. He doesn't do anything. He just simply says, rise and Lazarus rises. So why does he take the time to make this mud and to put it on his eyes and then tell him to go wash in this pool that means sin? There's lots of questions about that. It's an interesting miracle for a few reasons. And he goes to the trouble to make the mud. He tells him to wash in this pool. There isn't this immediate healing. Almost in all the other instances, when Jesus does something, they're immediately healed. But upon washing, when this man does exactly what Jesus says, then he's healed immediately. So this is still nothing like the fraudulent faith healers are on TV who are all like, look, your, your muscles are beginning to regenerate. People start shaking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, when Jesus heals somebody, he heals them instantly. And the stuff you see on television, they're frauds, okay? They're frauds. It doesn't match with Scripture. So even here, once the man's washed in the pool, he's immediately healed. But it's still different from his other miracles. Why the mud? Why the pool? Why all this? And it helps, I think this, I'm going to tell you this, okay? Give you a few reasons why. It helps us if we remember how Jesus works. Jesus works on multiple levels at a single time. In fact, other pastors have said this, Jesus is doing thousands of things in any one moment. And you and I are aware of like one or two of them. But that's how God works. That's the magnitude of our God. Think of, think of it like chess and hundreds of moves ahead, right? Or multiple moves ahead. This is what's happening here. So what is, why is this? Well, here, let me give you a couple reasons why. Here's the first one. God often uses means to accomplish his work. God often uses means to accomplish his work. Sometimes God speaks and a miracle occurs, like creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Other, other times, he uses means. I'll give you an example. He could have just floated Jonah to land, 
right? We went through the study on Jonah. He could have just floated Jonah to land, but what did he do? He's in a giant fish to swallow him. That's what we call means. God uses means. He could have just separated the Red Sea, but instead, what did he do? He sent a great wind. God often uses means to do his work. He can miraculously cure polio, right? And he has at times, but he also gave us means like vaccines, okay? This is where the cults, the the quasi-Christian cults fall short when it comes to healing and medicine. They view those who use any type of medicine as a lack of faith. God will heal. Well, God does heal. He does heal miraculously, and he does heal through the miracle of modern technology, modern medicine. God uses means. So say God wants to punish Dallas um, for the way, the city of Dallas, for the way they treated the great coach Tom Landry so many years ago. Let's say God wants to punish Dallas, right? He could just punish Dallas, but sometimes he uses means. So what did he do? Well, he sent Tony Romo, right? Year after year, year after year, like this is the year. It's going to happen year after year. And then like the most Christian player in all of football, just giving the ball to the other team. Like, here you go, guys, right? That's what he did. So God uses means. That's what he does. God often works through means. So one of the things God is doing here is he's showing us that, that he uses means. Jesus uses means. He uses the mud here and the pool to heal the blind man. But that's not it. Here's the second thing. Early church fathers saw the clay as a reference to creation. And I don't think that's a stretch. I think they're right on that. In John's first chapter, we learned about Jesus' role in creation, right? That Jesus was there and Jesus, all things were made through him. And there was not anything made uh, without him, right? All, everything was made through him, including man, including woman. From where? The dust of the ground. So here we have Jesus using dust, using clay to repair in his own creation, what sin is corrupted, what sin is distorted. Nothing that would have been noticed in the moment because people are just caught up with what's happening. Why is he spitting and making mud? But for years and centuries, as his followers pour over his teachings and over his works, it's one of those times that makes people go, oh, yeah, the creator, using what he used originally to make man, using it to fix what sin is broken. Third thing, wash And the pool called Siloam literally means sent, we're told. The blind man is delivered by the sent one. The readers of John's gospel can trace the pattern. Jesus has already referred to himself as sent from the Father. And here the sent one has delivered once again. So you see like all these things that he's doing, this multi-level, multiple moves ahead in chess, all of these factors help explain why Jesus did what he did. And don't miss the result. Look at verse 7. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. He washed and just like that he came back seeing. A man who had never seen anything. Imagination was nothing like reality for this man. A man who must rely on the charity of others to just survive. Who's resigned to a life of poverty and castigation. He came back seeing. Imagine the wonder. He's just looking at the back of his hands, the hair and the the tendons and the knuckles and the way the fingers work and they bend and he turns his hands around and he sees the creases and the veins and his pulse and just imagine the sensory overload for him. Water, the blues, the oranges, the reds, the purples, the fruit, the animals, the clothes. He looks on his parents for the first time. Imagine what he sees. And don't miss this in the text either. The joy, the sheer amazement that he experiences is just a glimpse. It's just a shadow. It's a taste of the spoon, right? Well, mom's cooking of everything that's waiting for all of us as believers in the new heaven and the new earth. For the first time, the scales of our eyes will fall off. And I'm not just talking about cataracts and detached retinas. Our eyes, even our eyes are affected by the curse. We've never seen colors like God originally intended. But one day, we open our eyes to the throne, and we will see truly and purely the king who sits on the throne. One day, like this blind man, we will see like we've never seen before. Healing a blind man from birth 
Why is this a sign? Why is Jesus showing us this? What is he showing us? And one of the things he's doing is that resurrection power, that only Jesus can transform somebody like this. Only Jesus has that kind of transformation power. Only Jesus can instantly heal somebody from a lifetime of disabling sickness. And if he can do that, what else can he do? If he can forgive a lifetime of soul-crushing sin, Jason, you, you don't understand the things in my past. You don't understand, Jason, the pain and the dark, and I, and I have so much shame, and I don't think he can do anything about it. And I'm saying you don't know Jesus very well. That's why he heals this blind man. The world has no answer, no cure, hopeless. And Jesus says, see. And the mountain of sin that you and I have accumulated in our life, the baggage we carry, the one who says, see, the one who tells the lame man to get up, the one who says, Lazarus, rise. He says to everyone who repents, forgiven. That's what he does. And just like that, just like that man was instantly healed, you and I instantly forgiven, a lifetime of sin erased forever. That's resurrection power. You can have that today. Christian, you do have that. It's foreshadowing of that last day when Christ returns, the conquering king, and he bids us rise. And just like the the grave couldn't hold Jesus, the grave will not hold us. But Jason, I'm, I'm haunted by my past. And I ask you, have you repented? Because if you have, it's gone. And you're saying, remember that sin, God, that I talked about before. Remember that sin that I've talked about a lot. And God says, no. What sin? It's covered. It's removed. It's gone. And if you haven't repented, let today be the day. Turn and be on the receiving end of that word, that mercy, that grace, forgiven, my child. The Pharisees, they're furious at Jesus for healing this man on the Sabbath. They drag in his man's, this man's parents. And his parents are intimidated because of the power that these Pharisees have. And so they're like, well, look, just ask, ask him. We don't know. We're, we're scared. We don't know. Ask him. Look at verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man, they're speaking of Jesus, is a sinner, right? He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already. You would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him. Right? Yes, it's great. He's doing it. He's messing with them. You want to hear it again? Do you guys want to follow him too? And they just, they revile him. They curse him. Right? You are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The faith of this beggar puts them to shame. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it's he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. That's a, that's a scary, important statement. Pharisees had made this labyrinth of rules for the Sabbath, so while this man's ecstatic that he can see for the first time in his life, they're furious that Jesus is healing people again on the Sabbath when they said nobody's allowed to work on the Sabbath, and that includes healing. He hasn't broken God's law. He's broken their false religion of personal righteousness. They've set themselves up as equal to God, and they hate it. They hate it that Jesus is tearing it down. Admit it. Admit it he's a sinner. They want this man because now his testimony has some bearing, some weight on people. Admit he's a sinner. Admit he's a sinner, and I love his response. Whether he's a sinner, I do not know, but I know that I I was blind, and now I see. And why do you want to hear from me again? Do Do you also want to become his disciples? I mean, he was blind, but he was a character. 
This man was full of life, full of life, and he begins to play with these leaders because they've never cared about him. Ultimately, in disgust, they remove him from the synagogue. They cast him out. That's normally a devastating punishment. It's probably what his parents were afraid of, public shunning. It's devastating to one's work, to one's relationships, to one's reputation. But he had none of those things. He had been castigated and rejected his entire life. These folks never cared about him, and they don't care about him now. The only person that cared was Jesus. And though he doesn't know who Jesus is fully at the beginning of what we read, he's loyal. He's not a Christian, but he's loyal. But look where you see that turn from interest, from loyalty to, to saving faith. Back to verse 35. He heard that they had cast him out, and so having found him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he? And I'll believe him. I'll believe what you say, right? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus seeks the man out again, and we see this progression that John highlights all through his gospel from interest to saving faith. We saw it with the woman at the well, saw it with the, uh, um, the, the man of wealth, the man of means, like the woman at the well who said, give me this water. The man says, tell me who is the son of man that I may believe. You have seen him, Jesus says. It's such a full statement. You have seen him. In other words, you are looking at him. You have seen him with your eyes because the scales have fallen off, and you also now are seeing him with your heart. You are seeing him. The blindness of sin, those scales have fallen off, and for the first time, he truly sees Jesus for who he is. You see the contrast between light and darkness? You notice the irony? The one who was blind now sees. The one who only knew darkness now knows the light. Yet the others who claim to see who claim to have the light, are blind as the beggar ever was, withering away in the darkness of their self-righteous lives. This is the irony of the cross. You lose your life for Jesus' sake, and you find it. You forfeit your attempts at personal salvation, and you find salvation in Jesus. That's the irony of the cross. But you keep claiming to have the way, to have the vision, to know what you're doing. You remain in darkness, blind as anyone could ever be. John 5, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. There is forgiveness and salvation for anyone. For the chiefest of sinners, as Paul says, but it's only through the name of the Son of God. Do you know him today? Do you see him? And I mean, do you really see him? It's time that you see him and believe. And if you do know him, and you are a follower of Christ, but you still can't help but be haunted by the darkness, worried about the things in the corners, the shadows, wait in hope because the king's returning. And when he returns, the light of the world will eradicate darkness forever. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we go to prayer, I'm going to ask folks to come forward and begin to pass out the bread and the wine, the bread and the cup. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for King Jesus. For many of us here, Lord, we're so grateful that by your grace, your mercy, you reached down and the scales of our heart, of the eyes of our heart fell off. And we're able to see truly Jesus for who he is. And thank you for that. Lord, may we cling to him in hope and in faith. May the miracle of what he's done in our hearts be on our mouths for others to tell others. And I pray for those that are here today that may not see that today would be the day of their salvation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.